this paper is motivated by the idea that political theory needs basically not only to deal with politics and political institutions, but that they have to relate it to economic interests, to the capitalistic development, and that they have to be related to the uh, conflicts which arise out of this situation. And, and for this reason, I went back uh, to, in times of crisis, uh, back to Hannah Arendt's idea to find some solution within Montesquieu's uh, theory of governments. And uh, at the end, I will possibly give a little outline of if we not can find a new kind of democracy with the conceptions of Hannah Arendt. So this is a little bit an introduction into uh, Montesquieu's theory of government and what we possibly can do with this because the dichotomization between politics and the political as we have it in the writings from Ancier, Badiou and others, I think uh, um, uh, missing uh, the mediation, the dialectic, so to speak, between the system and lively uh, power. And I would think that uh, Ancier and others are not uh, thinkers, uh, di not dialectic thinkers, even if they stand in a Marxist tradition. However, understanding political change with Montesquieu. Montesquieu's book, The Spirit of Laws, had an important meaning for many and very different authors. Hegel, Deltai, Durkheim, Cassira, Aron, Neumann, Louis Althusser, Hannah Arendt, to name only a few, all of them recognize the explanatory power of his opus magnum. If one looks at the reception of the book, Ernst Forsthoff, for example, estimation that the fame of this work is based above all on an equally important and narrow section, is based on the separation of the English, uh, appropriation of the English constitution in the sixth chapter of his 11th book, in which the separation of powers is set out and made a demand. The complete work, however, had been neglected. The conclusion of Forsthoff that the book of the a spirit of laws belonged to the admittedly well-known but least read books of the world literature is, however, only partially correct. For Durkheim, for example, the book represents the foundation stone of social, social sciences. Nobody, says Durkheim, has recognized as well that conditions are necessary for founding his science as Montesquieu. Aron even reads Montesquieu as a teacher of sociology, whose crucial contribution is to have connected the analysis of forms of governments with the analysis of social organizations. Ernst Cassira understands Montesquieu's theory of government as a forerunner of Marx Weber's ideal types. Franz Neumann, Louis Althusser, and Hannah Arendt read him as a political scientist. While Althusser speaks of a revolution of the method because Montesquieu understands governments as social totality, Neumann identifies the question of justice as central thought in Montesquieu. Hannah Arendt, on the other hand, in a critical, read, critical reading of Montesquieu's theory of government, the, discovers the key to differentiating the totalitarian form of power from previous forms of rule and critically reflects his understanding of political freedom and power. Althusser rightly emphasizes that Montesquieu starts from the assumption that a science of the political can be based solely on its specific subject and that the political as such is something radically independent, though social preconditioned, it critically reflects. For Montesquieu, the primacy of the theory of government over the sociological factors is conditioned by his uh, fundamental question of his writings, the question of political freedom, and the question of the best possible government or constitution. I have to say that there's always some noise behind it. I don't know if it comes from my computer or from your side. Do you know? Okay, or some... Uh, now it's getting a little bit better. 
In what way Montesquieu, as a pre-bourgeois thinker of postmodern post-bourgeois societies, can eliminate post-democratic times with the distinction between the nature of government and the principle of action, and what signifies that perspective might have for a critical political theory is the subject of my contribution. To begin with, I outline Montesquieu's subject in his book of the spirit of laws, then go a little closer to the theory of government in particular. For those who are just reading the paper as well, I skip a little bit because it will be too long. So what, what is the subject of the book that William Diltai considered the greatest uh, work of the 18th century? I quote, the work deals with the laws and customs and customs of all peoples of the earth. It is fair to say that its theme is immeasurable since it it encompasses all the institutions that have been introduced among men. Alchester rightly pointed out that it is precisely this subject that distinguishes him from all other authors who attended before him to make a science a science, for before Montesquieu no one had the audacity to be his direct thinking to our customs and laws of all people of the world. If Montesquieu had first of all tested men, he guessed that in the infinitive multiplicity of their laws and customs, men let themselves be guided only by the inspirations of their whims. In the spirit of laws, he writes, I quote, I establish principles and seen how the individual objects fits into them as if of their own accord, how the history of people is merely their consequences, how each particular law is connected with another or one other more generally. But the way in which Montesquieu unfolds his ideas has been criticized in research at this book, as this book lacks of unity. According to Raymond, uh, Raymond Aron's account, the book is divided in three parts. The first part represents the three forms of government and political sociology that reduces the variety of forms of government. Uh, sorry, Tomas, could you please close your window uh, because I'm hearing all the rain. Is it possible? I sure. Now it's better. Thank you. And uh, not not your video. I meant your I meant the window because I'm uh, always hearing the rain. <laughs> sorry. Um, I don't know. The material and physical causes are discussed in the second part, where he's dealing with climate, soil, customs, institutions, where the third section, uh, there were social, he deals with the social causes, trade, money, which is dedicated to the population side and the influence of religions or customs and laws. The concluding book deals with historical illustration, illustrations with the question of how to draft laws, while book 12 deals with the mindset of a nation. According to Aron, the book is definitely one of the most important ones. It forms a transition or connection between the first part of the spirit of law, political sociology, with the other two parts, which investigates the physical and moral causes. But not only the structure of the book shows the peculiarity of Montesquieu's cognitive of interest and his method. In contrast to Thomas Hobbes, Montesquieu does not base the different forms of government either, neither on basic anthropological assumptions about nature and the nature of man or the association classical distinction between the state of nature and the social contract. <clears throat> He also speaks of a state of nature in society, but not of the social contract. Thus, he formulates in the third chapter of the eighth book, I quote, in the state of nature, people are indeed born in equality, but they cannot persist in it. Society makes them lose equality, and only by law they do become equal again. Quote end. By referring to the Persian letters, Althusser shows that Montesquieu considers the question of the origins of society to be absurd and even ridiculous to him. He justifies his rejection of the origin of society by referring to a society that has always been presupposed. I quote, I never heard, never heard in public law that one carefully investigates that what is the origin of society, which seems ridiculous to me when people know society formed if they left each other and fled for another. Then one would have to ask why and find out why they are separated. 
but they are all born already interconnected. A son is born with his father and maintains that it is already society and the cause of society. Quote end. <clears throat> but Montesquieu does not stop here. He speak of, speaks of a fourth law of nature, the urge of man to live in society. If one wants to speak of an anthropology at Monte, of Montesquieu, it is more in a negative sense because he assumes that humans are conditioned beings, and he examines precisely these different conditions of people. He describes the conditional conditions of man as follows, I quote, different things govern man, climate, religion, laws, governmental princip principles, examples of the past, customs and habits, and from all this springs and shapes the mental attitude of the people. The stronger one of these people acts on one of these grounds, the more the others withdraw. I think that's quite an interesting and very important thing if we speak about, for example, economic interest. If these grounds get stronger, other people go into the background, or even if we speak about COVID-19, that health suddenly comes to the fore and other <clears throat> demands uh, 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 decline in this sense. Although he refers to ancient times, he does not do so to think things are different in reality or similar. Rather, he endeavors to meet her spirit. Although Montesquieu's perspective on the socio-political condition of his times applies to the question of which constitution is best for guaranteeing political freedom, but it would be wrong to assume that he contrasts the circumstances with an ideal that must be realized. On the contrary, Montesquieu wrote that he had taken his principles not from his prejudice, but from the nature of things. Althusser describes this methodological procedure as a revolution of the method because Montesquieu refers to the analysis of what is and not what should be. But what are these different conditions and what are the relationships between them? To answer this question, it is important to clarify the special nature of the government of Montesquieu. In the third book of the principle of the three forms of government, Montesquieu writes, I quote, between the nature and the principle of government is the following difference. The nature of government is what it is, the principle of what it does. Nature in its own particular structure, the principle lies in the human passion that determines its movement. Therefore, he continues, laws must conform to the principle of government as well as their nature, and it is necessary to seek that principle, quote, end. These sentences from the third book already contain the basic idea of his government teaching, which marks the difference to traditional government teachings. Montesquieu assumes that different forms of government corresponds to different principles of action. The history of previous forms of government, according to Montesquieu, show that each corresponds to different principles of actions, the source of which corresponds to fundamental experiences that people make in social coexistence. Thus, the distinction is made between the nature of a form of a government and its principle of action to, in order to emphasize at the same time that its sources are to be found in basic human experiences. The nature or structure of the state form is what distinguishes it from other forms of government, while its principle determines the way in which it is acted upon. Thus, in turn, in, in is based on a common basis of human experiences. First of all, Montesquieu distinguishes three forms of government, as you probably all know, the republic, the monarchy, and the despotism. I quote, the republican government is the one in which the people as a whole, or even as a part of the people, hold the supreme power. The monocle is that in which a single but firmly governed law rules, while in the despotic, an individual without law directs everything to his will and whims. The Republic is discussed by Montesquieu in two forms, democracy and aristocracy. I quote, once in the Republic, the people as a corporation have the sovereign power, we have a democracy before us. As soon as the sovereign power lies in the hands of a part of the people, it is called aristocracy. Montesquieu thus revises the 
Aristotelian classification by presenting both democracy and the aristocracy as two forms of the Republic. Unlike Aristotle, he does not interpret tyranny as a degeneration of the moderate form of government, but as an independent form of government. Thus, Montesquieu introduces with his div uh, division two innovations, which, however, remain in the traditional form of government. What remains separate, what really separates Montesquieu from its predecessors, however, is not only its object, as Hannah Arendt and Louis Althusser emphasize, but above all, the introduction of a new question, which thus also goes beyond the classical concept of the theory of government. So what is Montesquieu's transformation of classical government theory? Following both Arendt and Althusser's reading, there are two points to be noted. The extension of classical government theory is that Montesquieu not only identifies different forms of government, which are essentially distinguished by the number of rules, but these different ones assigns to the government a principle that corresponds to them, which both produces and guarantees the continuity of government. The Republic needs the principle of virtue, the monarchy, the principle of honor, and the despotism, the principle of fear. While political virtue is committed to the idea of equality, honor relies on diversity, on emphasizing others, and the fear of despotic government is based on equality and impotence. Montesquieu also calls these principles driving forces of action. While the introduction of these principles, as Ari points out, forms of government are put into movement and linked to historical experiences. Montesquieu introduces history and historical processes in governmental structures. Uh, Althusser also sees this. I quote him, through the principle, we bring it into life. Quote end. The essence of Montesquieu's theory of government is thus that it liquefies the rigid static form of class classical government theory and introduces a mediating level through the principle of action. If a principle of action corresponds to each of the form of government, this, is in no, this in no way applies a determinism. I quote Montesquieu, these are the principle of three forms of government, but that does not mean that one is virtuous in every republic, but only that one should be, nor to prove that in every monarchy one has honor and in every single despotic state fear, but that one ought to have it because otherwise the government would be imperfect. Uh, I skip a little bit because of time. Uh, here are some ideas regarding education, but I th go to the important thing for my idea regarding Montesquieu. It is a decline of every form of government always begins with the decay of the principle. In the understanding of Montesquieu, the existence of every form of government depends on the principle. Once the principle of a government has been corrupted, the best laws become bad and turns against the state. But if the principle are sound, even bad laws work well. Quote end. Essentially, the state can only change in two ways, either because the constitution is improved or because it is getting worse. If he has kept his principles and the constitution changes, he improves. If he loses it, if the constitution changes, it will deteriorate. The mutual relationship of condition which Montesquieu understands with the surface of the government and the principle of action thus con contains a criterion according to which the praxis of the rulers and the government can be judged. If a political community sees itself as a democracy, this community, if it does not contradict its own self-image, must conform to the basic principles of the democratic institutions in the principles of actions of the rulers and the governed. The decay of forms of government, as Montesquieu puts it, always begins with the decay of principles which can have both indigenous and exogenous factors. If the factors are indigenous, they are uh, by the abuse of power. The factors are exogenous, they are, then they are conditioned by extra institutional factors, which Montesquieu calls material, physical causes, climate, soil, institutions, as well as social causes, trade, money, the number of people and religion to customs and customs and law. 
The indigenous and exogenous factors can undermine or destroy the principle of action for both rulers and rulers. Uh, rulers, yeah, there's a mistake. <laughs> if one considers the basic assumption of Montesquieu that different things dominate the people, climate, religion, laws, governmental principle, models of the past, custom and manners, it should be stressed that the dominance of one of them factors, other factors are even destroying them. Montesquieu has discussed all these factors listed in relation to the forms of government he has uh, developed. And uh, he, uh, I go into here how he uh, discusses the size of a society and which form of government uh, corresponds to uh, this, um, um, to this form of government. But uh, anyway, I will just say it is not the place to discuss the various exogenous and endogenous factors that can cause government's decay. Anyhow, what can be productively used by Montesquieu's writing today is not so much the content of his writing or his contentional conclusions, but his form and method of theory production, his turn to reality, which was interdisciplinary before even the emerge of the social sciences, he thereby gave up the stubbornness and peculiarity of the political. It turns out that the pre-bourgeois thinker Montesquieu in his work, The Spirit of Law, correlates conditions of yeah, conditional conditions with the form and principle of go uh, government with social causes that are, or are of urgent topicality under today's post-bourgeois social relations. Uh, against the background of this current debates on the crisis of democracy, Montesquieu's discussion seem worthy of a reading, among other reasons, because the current attempt to grasp the crisis of democracy, the discourse on politics and the political, the term post-democracy, the discussions about democracy and capitalism, and almost, almost always revolve around the connection between the institutional order and political action, but not on the social causes. If one relates Montesquieu's distinction between the form and the principle of government to today's debate, one immediately catches, uh, one moment immediately catches the eye. With Montesquieu, not only the distinction, disintegration of form and principle of the government is, that is, the stagnation of political institution could be stated. The distinction and the unity of form of principle can also allow an analysis process which examines whether the principle of the respective governments, which should be relevant for both the ruling and the governed, not the basic or of act, are the basic of action or not. Montesquieu's distinction just provides a criterion for judging the praxis of the governing and governing alike. Or at the same time, it opens up the possibility of determining whether either indigenous factors, abuse of power, or exogenous factors, social factors, social injustice, underline the non-observance of principles, or whether both exogenous and endogenous factors mutually condition or reinforce each other. With Montesquieu distinction, it becomes possible to grasp the connection between politics, political institutions, and their social uh, preconditions. Katrin Meyer has pointed out that within the recent debates on the crisis of democracy, it is not just a question of the democratic deficit of present political institutions and constitutions, the erosion of democratic processes through power games of influential lobbyists, the legal rights of political conflicts, or the neoliberal deregulation of the economy, which in recent decades has led to the political self marginalization of the influence of nation state, but that an understanding of democracy in the sense of a sovereign consensus oriented, oriented people's rule, which does not attach any intrinsic value to the political dispute and tends to be technocratic, is in disposition. The debate about the concept of post-democracy will only be grasped if the prefix post is understood not only historically, but also systematically. From a systematic point of view, however, today the much more difficult question is whether in viewing of changing social conditions, new forms and new principles must be developed by democratic governments that respond to modern social realities and live up to the conception of political freedom that bears this name 
that deserves this name and does not open the door for further destruction of democratic institution to an unleashed capitalism. For a critical political theory, it might be enlightened to examine the connection between the form and the principle of government to analyze its dangers through indigenous and exogenous factors so that citizens of a political democratic community can critically reflect on the praxis of the rulers and those of the uh, governed. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>